All right. Hey there, folks. Since book tour and conventions are still on hold for a bit, I figured I'd bring book tour to you. So welcome to Russ's Rock and Roller Coaster Season 4, Intriguing Interviews with Creative Minds. Now, everyone here tonight and those watching at home are all Star Wars fans. And no entry in the Star Wars universe has been more divisive than Ryan Johnson's The Last Jedi. Some consider it to be a new classic. Others claim it's an epic misfire and a handful fall somewhere in between. So to figure, on, to figure all this out, on our panel is Krasava Myers, an author, entertainment journalist, and chief editor of the Star Wars news website, Scavengers Holocron. Hello, Krasava. Hello, thanks for having me. All right. Okay, and back on our show is Reverend Dr. Leah D. Shade, an assistant professor of preaching and worship at Lexington Theological Seminary in Lexington, Kentucky. An ordained minister in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, Leah is the author of five books, including the forthcoming volume co-authored with Jerry Sumney, Apocalypse When, a guide to interpreting and preaching apocalyptic apocalyptic texts. She also has contributed chapters to two anthologies about the Blade Runner franchise, Less Human Than Human, in Blade Runner 2049 and Philosophy, This Breaks the World, and Skin Jobs and Snow Jobs, Blade Runner 2049, and Cly Fi Noir, and Race Erasure in the Cyberpunk Nexus, Exploring the Blade Runner Universe. Hello, Leah. Hey, Russ, it's great to be back with you. All right, great to see you. And for those who are watching, um, Zaki Hassan was going to be with us tonight, but unfortunately he had to cancel at the last minute for um, a personal situation he had to deal with. So it's just going to be the three of us. Okay, so just a heads up to the folks at home. Feel free to send me notes or questions that you have for the panel in the chat box during the show, and we'll get to a few at the end. Also, and I've never done this before, but tonight I feel like... I'm going to just to be on the safe side. I know there are a lot of strong feelings about The Last Jedi. So if you're sending notes in the chat box, be sure to keep them civil and respectful. All right, so let's jump in. All right, so I just, I watched the movie when it first came out and then I just rewatched it the other day. So it's fresh in my mind and I took a lot of notes. So in one of the early scene, earliest scenes of the movie, Ray hands Luke his old lightsaber, which he dismissively tosses aside and walks away. Now, this is the first moment where Luke actually interacts with anyone on screen in like 35 years. So within the Star Wars universe, it's not just a moment, but the moment, something us lifelong Star Wars fans have been begging for for more than three decades. Now to me, this moment pretty much set the tone for the rest of the movie. What did you guys think about it, Krasava? Uh, I think right there, he set the tone that basically, um, like he always said that he wanted to subvert audience expectations. That what he, that's what he did was he completely subverted audience expectations. You expect Luke to take this back. You expect it to be emotional moment. And then it's just not, he takes all that legacy, all that Star Wars lore, and he just throws it away. Now, at the same time, I feel like in a sense that can also be seen in the movie as a whole, how Ryan just completely dismisses and disrespects all of the canon that came before it because all the other things all the other elements that he pulls into this like tracking through hyperspace and suddenly ships have fuel it's almost like he didn't watch the last movies that came before it, and he's just making this all up on the fly so on one hand you could say oh this is a cool moment because he's just throwing out all the rules and he's making his own but then on the other hand it's sort of can be seen as just completely disrespecting the franchise as a whole. Leah? I agree that it definitely set the tone for the movie. What it did for me, it symbolized uh, an overturning of a symbol of the movie. And from right out of the gate, almost every part of the movie is trying to overturn the mythology, the symbolism, the um, the, the whole milieu of how we understand this universe. And uh, I agree with you, Krasava. I think that um, there is a, there are moments of real disconnect, like, okay, if you're going to do that, at least try to get your facts straight. On the other hand, I want to argue that I think that this moment, that, that this movie was in some ways necessary. I think there needed to be a moment of reckoning like there is with any uh, mythology, with any religion, 
where it takes a look at itself and tries to deconstruct and find out what is the essence of who we are. And when everything falls apart, what is the center that holds? I felt this movie was doing that. Did it misfire and miss in different places? Yes, it did. I'm sure we're going to talk about that. But I, I think this, this was a necessary movie. So interesting. So uh, we're going to follow up a little bit. Uh, the question that you asked, we're going to get to at the end about, you know, what does it kind of fundamentally mean? Now, for me personally, I found it an absolute atrocity that that moment, not because he wanted to deconstruct and say, listen, let's look at it through a new lens. But let me ask you, this is whether you like it or not, or agree with it or not, the nine movie saga is the Skywalker saga. It is. Now, you don't have, you can like that or not like it, but that's what it is. Is it appropriate to say in episode eight of a nine episode saga to say everything that came before is wrong, we have to kill it. My, my viewpoint of it is right and everything that you've believed or saw with it before is wrong. And they say that yeah. verbatim, the characters say it verbatim in the movie, right? Um, Kylo says, if you don't like your past, kill it. He says that over and over, kill it, kill the past, kill the past. So as a viewer, why do I want to watch a movie where you're telling me a fan of 40 years to kill everything I've loved for 40 years? What's, what do you think? No, oh, absolutely. I completely agree with everything that you just said. Like, I totally understand there was a chance to um, kind of rewrite the rule book and go back to the basics. And I feel like Rogue One did that really well. I feel mm. like there's a time and a place to do it. And it's in a standalone movie. It's not in a movie, like you said, like movie eight out of nine films. Like this was not the time and place. Like JJ had everything set up so well. And I'm sure you're gonna touch on this later. He said so many questions and so many great characters. There was Snoke, there was Phasma, even who is Rey. And then when we get to it, it's like, oh, Phasma, yeah, she's dead. Snoke, he's dead too, Rey, she's nobody. Does not even matter. It's like all the, mystery boxes that JJ set up, Ryan's just sort of like, eh, I don't want to play with these. And he just dumps them in the garbage like their last year's Christmas presents. Like he doesn't want anything to do with them. And it almost feels like he had his own idea for his own space movie. And he just kind of took it and threw it into the Star Wars universe. And so I feel like that's why there's such a mismatch between Star Wars fans and um, just people that like, like Ryan Johnson's work in general, because I, I tend to find I talk to a lot of people and people who liked Ryan Johnson's work before this, like Looper and Breck, they liked The Last Jedi and people who didn't like Johnson's work before didn't like The Last Jedi. So I feel like Johnson had his own sort of, um, uh, he put his own personal touch on the movie, but there was too much Ryan Johnson and not enough Star Wars. Hmm. That's a good point. I one of the things that I wrestled with was Ray not being anybody, being a nobody. And one of the things that I found intriguing was the, the break in the family saga, that here was a nobody out of nowhere who, um, who had, the, you know, had access to the force. I actually kind of appreciated that. I liked the idea that it, it wasn't just the family franchise, that, that the force really was, uh, as uh, Luke says in the movie, it's, it's everywhere. You, mm -hmm. the, the Jedi don't have the trademark on this. And so, so then when you get to the last movie and you're like, oh, yeah, so that's not where we end up after all. <laughs> so, well, there, so it's like the, so the, 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 the real break, I think, was so the, the, the last movie felt like it had to correct mistakes of this movie. And I wish there would have been just more continuity mm -hmm. all along through the last three. Um, I still like the ideas that that Johnson is trying to put out there, but um, it just it it made for a lot of breakpoints and and uh, disjunctures that I think felt very unsatisfying for people. And then it, it set up a really difficult situation for the last movie to try mm -hmm. to deal with yeah. what was handed. Now, to. what you had said, I thought that, um, and it was a very small moment. I mean, we're talking 15 seconds of dialogue where ultimately Luke says Leia to uh, Ray, the four, you know, he says, you know, he says, what do you think the, you know, the Jedi, you know, what do you think the force is? What do you think the Jedi, well, 
the Jedi's have power and they, you know, move have, rocks. We, we can move rocks. Now, <laughs> uh, honestly, now I thought that was just a foolish, just just a horrible piece of dialogue because she's been with the, she is in touch with the force enough to know that it's more than that. I mean, she she answered it like she was 10 years old and not yeah. like she was 20 years old. And it was really hand, it was really ham fisted and poorly constructed. But his answer, I agree, was right, which is that, you know, the force, again, it goes back to that original mythology. The, the Jedi doesn't have a claim on the force. The force exists. It's there for everyone. And I do appreciate the sense that the Skywalker family doesn't have um, ownership of the force. And then there's everyone else. Um, but the fact that they were so aggressive about, you know, you're nobody, you're nothing. That's not true. It's not that... It's not that Ray was nobody and she was nothing. It's just that she was just she was just one of you know billion a billion you know sort of anonymous faces otherwise in the universe who would otherwise gone unknown. That doesn't make you a nobody, and that doesn't make you nothing. And that's something that was really sort of him trying to like tear her down. That wasn't about to me anyway ownership well, of of the force. Right. Well. Just just to clarify that that aggressiveness of saying you're nobody that was that was Kylo Ren. Yes, that that was him saying you know right at the in the in those final scenes, um, and this this line really was so cutting. You have no place in this story. That was, I, I mean, like when he said, I was like, wow. I mean, just trying to undercut who mm -hmm. she was. And, um, and, and I've read a couple of articles about how he really symbolizes the, the abusive male yep. um, in so many oh, ways. Really. And, and that, is, that was a classic line, you're a nobody, but, you're, but not to me. So you, mm -hmm. have to, you have to find your worth through me, me. Yes. The, the, the straight white male that is going to allow you into this partnership. Yes. And, and, and so, she, but she refused, she yes. refused. And and so then so then there's this fight over the lightsaber that at the beginning of the movie Luke Skywalker just tossed. Right. And so in that sense, I I like where it ended up symbolically. Like no, this does mean something. And then um uh um oh my gosh the Star stormtrooper turned resistance. What's his yeah. name? Finn. Finn, thank you. Um, and then Finn saying, you know, this does matter. This does matter. Um, and, and making his claim, like every character has, it, it, because of the way it's been, the movie sets it up that you have to make a choice. Where do you stand on this? And, and the viewer has to make a choice on this as well. What is it that we value about this story? What is it that we value about ourselves, about our humanity? What is it that we value about what is sacred in the universe? And so I, I do think that, and, and of course the, the lightsaber is split. So yeah. there, you know, where does it go from there? Um, but I, I like those moments. I thought that was a strength actually of the movie. Um, you know, they're interesting concepts. I just wonder if, you know, trying to be so aggressively subvertive, you know, why not just start off your own storyline and then do it there? What, you know, I, my, my big question is what, why in episode eight of a nine of a nine chapter saga, he could have started fresh with a new franchise, with a new trilogy and done his own thing. So let, let's just move on from that theory. So I want to stick with Luke for a little bit and then I'm going to move on. So again, so we, we, we see Luke, right? We come down to the planet and he sees Chewbacca for the first time in decades. Now, after all they've been through, all the adventures, literally life and death, right? They blew up two deaths, not one, two Death Stars. They were in it together, right? They overthrew Vader, they overthrew the Emperor, they saved the galaxy. But there was, we got no sense of, of their shared history. Not mm. a single moment where the two of them, like, like, hey, good to see a big guy and give him a hug. Nothing. They don't lament. Yeah, that's and they a don't, total missed opportunity. And they don't lament yep. together the death of Han Solo. I mean, right. just take 30 seconds. I mean, they were plenty <laughs> throwaway moments in this movie, which were completely irrelevant. That seemed to me, it wasn't just that it was a miss. It was sort of like an intentional, I'm not going to acknowledge this because I don't want to. At least that's the way it came across to me. Now, maybe that's not right. But that's as a viewer, again, someone who's been watching Star Wars for 40 years, 
how do you not have those two characters just have a moment? It just seems. Well, I think honestly, Mark Hamill said it best when he said, it's not Luke Skywalker. Maybe he's Jake Skywalker. He's not my Luke Skywalker because nothing in this movie is anything like that we've seen from Luke before. Luke was always optimistic. And just like Ray, when we first see Luke on Tatooine in A New Hope, he is that nobody. He has no idea what lineage has. Like you talk about like uh, how Ryan Johnson, you know, uh, served expectations. And, you know, some people are upset that he didn't give the audience what they want. I think a lot of people more or less would be okay with Ray being a nobody if they had done it properly and set a sort of set up an explanation. How did she get her force powers? How is she can so I, trained can to I, use the lightsaber? Can, can, yep. can I intervene for just a, just on that point? I don't oh. want to cut you off, but <laughs> I, I, I really take offense to the, 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 the dialogue about that Ray was a nobody. She wasn't a nobody. She may have not come from some sort of quasi, you know, you know, um, space royalty, space royalty, some <laughs> dynastic relationship, but she wasn't a nobody. She was a person. She was a person who otherwise may have gone unknown, but that doesn't make you a nobody. So I think, I think that just the way we're having a conversation about it, I do actually take a little bit of umbrage to that sort of phrasing of it. So anyway, I didn't mean yeah. to cut you off there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Cause that's a, that's a good point because I don't want to derail your uh, comment about, um, Luke and Chewie, but then that also just, it makes me think of Finn because just like Ray, Finn is also someone, no last name, no home, no family, has a sensitivity to the force. It's yep. like we're Ray and we're Finn are two peas in a pod. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to get to that. We're going to get to that. <laughs> okay. So sticking, so sticking with Luke, um, we're going to finish out this Luke thread a bit. So, all right. So Luke claims, so when we meet him now, he claims that he's cut himself off from the force now, first of all, this is the first time in, in you know, forty years that the notion that you could cut yourself on from the cut yourself off from the force has even been introduced in the movie. So that's just one thing, and a fairly significant plot point to sort of just happen to mention. Um, but he's saying I did it because engaging with the force is just too dangerous. Things can go south in a hurry. And on paper, if we accept the fact that cutting yourself from, off from the force is doable, all right, fine. Hey, you know what? I'm playing with fire with here. I just, it's better if I don't, I'll buy that. But he went into, into seclusion and in his own words, to die, that's what he said, I came here to die. Now this is basically on the force planet. This planet is like the source of the force. So let's just think about that for a second. So he cut himself off from the force in the place where the force is the strongest. <laughs> that seems a bit curious to me. Isn't that kind of like a Catholic renouncing Catholicism and saying, I'm done with the church, I'm done with Catholicism, I'm going into hibernation at the Vatican. <laughs> That's a great point, Russ. I mean, like, I, I don't know. In, unless that that's like his biggest test, you know, can I, can I exist in this space, the very, you know, the very heart of it and discipline myself to kind of create this wall around me and not, and, and, and be Im, Im, impervious to it. Okay. Which I would buy, which I would buy if they brought it up. That's what, that's what he does throughout the film. He brings up all these things like having like having to need fuel and things and then just sort of skates right by it. Like we're supposed to know like what the heck he's talking about when none of this stuff has ever been brought up before. So it's like, what? Because if the force is inside you, the force is everywhere, it's all around us and it's inside us. How can you cut something? How do you cut yourself off from something that's inside you? Like it doesn't. It needed a, it needed a lot more unpacking than we got. Yes. If if that's the way you want to go, if right. that's the plot point you want to develop, right. then you really have to you really have to take some time with that. Now beyond that, let me ask you this. So he's in seclusion, right? He said I he said, why do you think I I, I picked the farthest, you know, farthest away place in the galaxy? Kylo is is on a hunt to find him. Mm -hmm. You were on the freaking planet and you trained with Luke there, but you don't know where he is. Is like, that clear? Oh, I don't, I don't know I don't if that's, that was the same no. planet. Or, or was it not? I no. don't know. No, no. I don't believe so, no. 
So that because was so other, otherwise they, Kylo would know exactly where well, he right. he wouldn't that's have needed the was, map. That's why it was confusing. I think, I think the better question that you want to ask, if he came here to die, as you said, and he didn't want to be found, why make a map to his location to begin with? If you don't want to be found, why tell people exactly where you are and have them go on this whole massive scavenger hunt to find you? It doesn't make any sense. That's point taken. Huge, huge, huge hole. Huge <laughs> hole. Like where, where did the map come from? How did somebody know he was there? Why that? Why the big? Why the puzzle piece? I mean, it just. But and I will say, um, I mean, e even the the. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there, there are there are so many big puzzle pieces that don't really fit together in the movie yes. that we're trying to shoehorn in here. Um, yeah. And that's just, that's just one of them. And I think this map thing is, a, is <laughs> in sense is a symbol of things that just don't really work out logically, no. even without the whole star Wars mythology, there's just some things that don't make sense. All right. So um, last thing of uh, the, I want to move on to what I thought was the coolest sequence. This is to me in The Last Jedi. And in my mind, at least, maybe one of the coolest sequences in the entire nine movie saga. And that's the Rashomon sequence. We get three takes with different nuance about the same moment, right? Luke is standing over Kylo Ren in the hut with the lightsaber out, right? And we get three very different perspectives on it. And each one, reveals a different layer of um of that transaction so why don't you talk to me about that a little bit i think that's a that that is a a really interesting um device to see the same story from different perspectives although even that still didn't quite add up to me like the whole thing is just a big misunderstanding i i don't know it just <laughs> It, it, that you know oh you thought he was uh, kylo ren thought that luke was going to kill him and he did but not really and i mean it the whole thing is it was just a little confusing i like the concept of what they were trying to do yes. but the execution felt clumsy to me it was, yeah, it was, I completely agree with you. It didn't feel I mean, like a reason like, to go off and like now just go kill everybody. <laughs> like, right? Like what did the other students do? Like I could understand right. maybe, you know, you wake up and Luke's standing over you with a lightsaber. Instead of trying to like bring the roof down on him, you'd think he'd at least stop and be like, what are you doing? Right. Like, why are you doing this? Like he's one of his whole life. Like, like yeah. what's going on? Like, yeah. you'd, and, and then like you said, like it's a huge misunderstanding. It's like a five minute conversation would have just cleared the whole thing up. No one would have died. Like it doesn't make sense. And then if you read the uh, Kylo Ren comics to see how he becomes a uh, leader of the Knights of Ren, how he goes and actually has to hunt down each of the students individually when they run away. Like there's no reason for that except for just joining the dark side. That was his test. Yeah, it was. Like, a little, it felt a little bit, um, you know, I mean, even still like not only is Luke his teacher but he's his uncle too. Like, yeah. There, there's a lot of, you know, that, it, again, it, need, it needed more, um, they needed to take a moment and kind of like think this through a little bit. And like, yeah. I mean, what would have been, I, I thought would have been really incredible if, if instead of that final, you know, what the, what the F and they just, I, I quick battle you, bring the house down and I run away. If they had said what the F and they went at it and we saw this like epic lightsaber duel between the two of them. Cause one of the great moments in all of the Star Wars franchise the lightsaber duels are great, but what makes them so much better is the verbal sparring that mm -hmm. goes along with it, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much exposition going along with the battle scenes and that's where the real emotion comes out, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, my favorite, se my, I think my favorite sequence from the entire franchise is in Return of the Jedi, which I don't love as a movie, but the whole bit with Vader and Luke and the emperor and they're taunting him and just, just they're poking him to come out and there's and he and Luke wants to he wants to fight but he's like I know this is what they want from me I can't give in I can't give in I can't give in that's where all that gravitas comes from and mm -hmm. it seems like that was a moment that we could have had something to that effect he's like Luke you know what are you doing I don't know I'm, I'm worried about you don't be worried about me I'm fine I'm not fine and then on anyway 
Oh, that well, and great. It's, the way you're describing that, I'm like, I'm all for that. Yeah. Well, and especially since we have the showdown then on the salt planet, right. where they have this battle, we needed to have a prior. I mean, if you're going to keep with the, and of course, again, we're we're not doing that in this movie, but there needed to be a, a prior battle where somebody lost, and so you, so this is the battle to answer that first battle. Yep. So it just. It, it just felt like it didn't come, it just came out of nowhere all right so last it thing comes I, out of no oh sorry no go ahead so so finally i just we have there's a lot more I want to <laughs> oh yeah so last thing on luke and we're gonna and we're gonna move on so whether you thought it was a good idea or not you know star wars as we know it as i said it's the skywalker saga but luke as you said he was the heart and soul of of the saga and in this movie he was utterly joyless utterly joyless and as a fan, I just found that soul crushing to watch, to see Luke have not a glimpse of joy in any way, not a hint of peace or hope or joy at all. It was, I don't know. What did you guys think? Yeah, there was no emotional connection to it. Like I was just about to agree with you. Like the reason why the whole Luke and Kylo Ren build up is because there's no emotional connection. Because Luke is so bitter, we have no emotional connection to him. We don't get to build any emotional connection to any of these characters because they have no growth. And in the case of Luke, all that character progression that we've seen for the three movies just completely disappears. It's like, we're not even looking at Luke anymore and just, it, like you said, it's just soul crushing to watch. Well, that that's true. But I see it as a dark night of the soul. I mean, that so many people, so many leaders, mm -hmm. especially leaders with, with that kind of spiritual connection, they go through this. Yeah, it weighs on you. And, and you know, in the end, he comes through. But that's why I said, I think this is necessary. I think we needed to see Luke sh really struggling with, um, with failure and with, um, with depression mm -hmm. and with bitterness and, and to, um, like, to, to see everything kind of pulled inside out and, and what are we really made of. And, and you know, the, the moment that really, what, what brings him around it's R two D two, showing him, um, Obi Wan Kenobi, you're our only Ooh, hope. Yep. <laughs> and then, and then, and there's a, that's it. This is the one moment where there's just a little bit of levity. He's like, oh, that's a cheap shot. <laughs> yeah. yeah no, it, it, it it was. I mean, for me, it was. You know, it was about two hours and twenty minutes too late. But in any case, um, all right. So, let's talk about Leia, and her spacewalk. Now. <laughs> I, oh, no, hold, okay, hold on, yeah. oh, no, no, but I, I, I put a lot of thought into this, all right? And this is where I think it, it's kind of, well, anyway. So I think it's fair. If you were to say to me, because remember at the end of um, Return of the Jedi, we now kind of know that Leia has force sensitivity at the very least, right? Mm -hmm. And if you were to say to me, look, she's been actively studying and utilizing the force for 30 something years, right, since Jedi, and is probably a master in her own right by this point. If you told me that, I would buy, I would buy that, okay? Now, they don't show it. We mm -hmm. never see her using the force at all mm -hmm. until she's blasted into space, mm -hmm. right? Yet, she's so powerful with the force that she survives on her own. Then, she's out of action for almost the whole movie. And then when she's healthy, she doesn't use any force powers in any noticeable way to help lead the way. They were just waiting for Luke to save the day. So is she a force master or no? I'll buy either argument, but it seems like they kind of like wanted it both ways just to have like that one big moment. What'd you guys think? I agree. I that just didn't i i don't care how filled with the force you are when you're out in outer space i mean that's it you're done you you, you can't just <laughs> open your eyes and just start floating i mean that just it was comical to me it yes. it just it it felt like it felt kind of insulting 
um, that this is, it just so, so incongruous that, that this is how, that this is what happens. And, um, and I, I think now it re remind me, she died during this movie, right? Yes. Well, so yeah, she died. So that so I've read is that she was supposed to be like the big hero of the ninth movie, but she died before they, I think, I think they were done filming. The second one had come out and she died. It was finished and she died before they started. It was the finished one. by that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They, but, but they used a little bit of footage that they had already shot for right for jedi right. and they used it in the last one because they, they had it and in that movie you actually see her training ray a little bit like as a as a as a master but that's not what ryan johnson is although that sequence was actually filmed i think earlier so it's possible that they just cut that you know training sequence out of the eighth movie or maybe it was in the maybe they shot it from the seventh one. No, they shot it for the seventh movie. Oh, they did. That makes more sense. Yeah. And look, yeah, and, I don't and, think there was anything that Ryan Johnson with yeah. Leia and the Force, aside from her Mary Poppins moment flying through yeah. space, which we all agree is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think honestly, <laughs> going off what you said on why don't we see her develop um the Jedi's uh like if she is supposedly this strong in the force. Obviously, I think just the whole moment makes no absolute sense. I think we just need to write that off and then focus on Leia and her choices. Like she chose to be a politician. She chose to follow in her father, Bail Organa's footsteps right. and be a politician mm -hmm. and be a general. That part of her that has the force has a connection to Darth Vader, which she does not want to be a part of. She doesn't have a trust in the force, I think, like mm. Luke does. So it's like, I'll train and I'll get stronger because you, Luke, want me to, because you want to protect me and because I'm your family and I do want to understand this feeling that's inside of me. But then she wants to go back to what she knows. She wants to pay homage to her father. She wants to pay, um, you know, tribute to her home country or country planet of Alderaan. You know, so I feel like that was her choice. And I would, and I, I, just, would I really love that, how she chooses not to use the force, that she's so strong. And, mm -hmm. you know, obviously like going around today, it's like, oh, if you could use the force, why not? But Leia makes that choice not to use it mm -hmm. I, I, until it really matters. Which, but... which is which is a totally valid position. And had they explored that even a little bit, it would have mm -hmm. given so much depth, so much depth to the story and to the character. So another mm -hmm. missed opportunity, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on to Finn, who was an exciting, dynamic character in The Force Awakens with an indication that he might have Force powers or Force sensitivity. He was utterly marginalized in The Last Jedi. He was just turned into comic relief with no agency and virtually no real purpose. He also had incredible chemistry with Rey in the first movie, which they just split up. Um, in the force so that Ray could focus on Kylo. So how did you feel about the way Finn got treated in this one? Finn got yeah. oh, treated horribly. Like even Ryan Johnson already said that he thought it would be funny to yeah. leave Finn in a coma throughout the entire movie and then just cut back to him garbling nonsense for comedic relief. So I think that's, you know, speaks volumes to not only how he viewed the character of Finn, but to how he viewed John Boyega as an actor. And John Boyega has been very vocal, you know, in the recent months, but just choosing to even, there was a great deleted scene for Finn where he's leading a stormtrooper uprising against Phasma, where he tells them what really happened. Like, oh, you let down the shields. You didn't fight for the first order where it really counted. And you see the stormtroopers like, eh, do we really trust Phasma? And then she turns around and shoots all them. And it was a great scene to show Finn emerging as a leader. And then that got cut. They already filmed it and that got cut in favor for what? Luke drinking green milk or the Adam Driver shirtless scene? Like at some point, it's like everything got pushed to, the, everything about Finn got pushed to the back burner in favor of all this other stuff that we didn't even need. And like you said, Finn and Ray's chemistry was like the best part of The Force Awakens. I left The Force Awakens so excited. Finn was my favorite character. I couldn't wait to see where his family was going to come from, how they were going to develop his force abilities, or if he'd be like Leia and he'd be a soldier and not necessarily develop his force abilities. And instead they just 
throw that all out the window and it's just like Finn is just you know bumbling around in a back to suit you know he's all so like focused on the glitz and the glam of Canto Bite that Rose has to be like hey by the way slavery is bad even though obviously he should know this he's a former stormtrooper that was conscripted from a child like it, it is just mind-blowing how poorly Finn's character was treated yeah Leia I I agree I um looking at this film through um, critical race theory, there are some really bad moments, really bad choices in this film. Like you mm -hmm. don't take a character like John Boy, an actor like John Boyega and basically turn him into, like you said, comic relief. Um, you don't take Poe and have two white women disparage him and his leadership and kind of laugh about him and emasculate him. Well, uh, well, you're getting you're getting you're getting ahead of me. You're getting ahead of me. Well, I'm, I'm just I'm just I'm <laughs> just saying a it's a yeah. bad yeah. look. Yeah. It's a bad. This movie was made in 2017. We know better. That those that kind of thing never should have happened. Agreed. Mm -mm. Okay. So actually, that so one of the major elements of the Last Jedi was turning Paul into an undisciplined, reckless jackass that got a lot of people killed. Now, to my mind, it seemed rather heavy handed that Ryan Johnson set up Poe to be this way just so that he could be slapped down and scolded. I and mean, this is a guy who's been a soldier for a long time. He understands chain of command. He understands what, how being, you know, there's a difference between sort of taking a chance and being overtly reckless that you're putting other people's lives in danger. He knows that. There's no way that he would do these things. But it, it's funny. After he got, first he did it. And he's like, well, no, what? I mean, look, we got the big ship. Wasn't it worth all me killing, you know, sacrificing all those deaths just to get that big ship? And of course he would never think that. And he got scolded for it. But then they become under attack. And then he says, she says, Leia says basically, oh, you just want to blow stuff up. Ha ha ha, right? And then they move on and then they're attacked. And he says, do you want me to go blow stuff up again? And she says, yeah, that would be good. So He's bad for being reckless, except mm -hmm. when they want him to be reckless. Right. So it seems like they kind of did this just, just so they could say, you know, we're going to put women in charge because this is a moment where it's the women's time. And what we're going to do is we're going to set this guy up to be a dickhead just so we can scold him in front of everybody. Right. That, that is right. exactly that, because I am a huge huge, huge fan of the Poe Dameron comic series and nothing that they've done in eight or nine corresponds anything to what has been set up about Poe in the comics. And I get the whole, oh, I just want to watch the movie. I don't want to have to have everything connect back to the TV shows and the comics and books. And I don't want to have to, you know, research all this for this to make sense. But it's just, it's terrible to take all that character development and it's part of a universe and just throw it out the window to, like you said, to appeal to like the Me Too movement because mm -hmm. people are like, oh, look at the diversity, look at the strong women. All the strong women exist in this film to serve a male agenda. Ray is there to help Luke come out of hiding. Ray is there to help bring Kylo Ren back to the light side. Um, Poe is there, or Haldo is there for Poe. Rose is there for Finn to teach him about slavery. So it just, the whole Holdo arc doesn't even, it just, it doesn't make sense. Like the Navy leadership second principle is keep your people informed. Like if she had just told Poe, who is like you said, just got called reckless, is known for being a troublemaker. You'd think like, oh, hey, I should at least tell him what's going on. Like that so whole thing. That, just made and that, that was my sort of next moment is that, so at that point in the movie, they're down to like 200 people. Like that's it. That's the entire resistance. And her big plan was, you know, we're going to sneak out the back door and my, and my solution is to commit suicide. But everybody on the team knows this, except for Poe. Now, how, you t how did, does that work? Is that a thing where 200 people know the plan except one person and the one person probably needs to know the most? It seemed like to me that that information was being intentionally withheld from the audience just so they can have that moment. It didn't feel organic at all. What did you think? Yeah, and I, I, I agree with that. And I think one of the reasons they had to, they felt maybe that they needed to, um, to put him in that light 
is I think they were trying to to go for another Han Solo kind of thing. Yep. And 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 they needed him to fill the gap. Um, but even Han, Han Solo, Solo would not he, have done these no, sort of things. Never. Yeah, right. Even still, like even Han was like, hey, you know, he didn't want to be part of it, but when called to action, he just joined. He just he joined right, in. and he wouldn't he wouldn't take unnecessary risks. Not like that. No way. Not like that. Not like that. That would get so many people killed. Although I will say, just as a complete side note, yes, I I mean, um, uh, Jay, uh, what's his name? The actor um, who plays Poe. Um, uh, uh, oh, Oscar Isaac. Oscar Isaac. Yes. Yeah. Great actor. He would be honestly. Oh, Oscar Isaac's phenomenal. Yeah, he would be my choice to be the new Indiana Jones. By the way, I think he would be absolutely. Oh, I like it. Ooh. Right. I don't think I that's going to happen, but that's yeah. that, 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 that's my choice. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So, no, no, no. Harrison said Indiana dies with him. Just throwing right. it out there. Harrison said Indiana dies with him. Well, it's not really up to him. So that's true. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about. So let's talk about the force connection between Kylo and Rey. All right. First, I have, and you brought it up. Was there any real reason we needed to have Kylo sweaty and shirt and shirtless? I mean, did, was that was that really something that we needed, or was that I just kind the, of like was that sort of a, just like an icky moment? I think the best question to ask is: Would that scene still have been necessary to include if Ray was a boy? Would that mm -hmm. scene have still been involved? Because I looked it up, and Ryan Johnson said the purpose behind that scene was creating uncomfortable intimacy to which really? I interpret it kind of like a dick pic. Like it's in your mm -hmm. face and you don't really want it, but it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, he's in, so Kylo's in his thirties and, and a total monster. And Ray is still what, 18, 19 years old. Um, Kylo Ren is 34 and Ray mm -hmm. is 19. 19, okay, right. And Ray continually says, you're a monster. And yet she still kind of wants to save him. Why? Now, I what's the connection? I mean, I could, I understood it in the first saga where in the first trilogy where Luke was trying to save Vader because that's his dad. There's a we understand, all right, I want to save my dad's soul before he dies. I get that. But what connection does Ray have to Kylo where she wants to go into the you know into the belly of the beast to save him? I I, I couldn't figure that one out. I, I thought it was more of a strategic move. Um, and I don't have the exact lines, but th there was a point where it was like, I, in in order, in order to, in order to bring down the the dark side, you want to convert him back to theirs. We've got to convert him back. Like that's the that's really the only way to do that. And because she did sense that there was turmoil and tension and conflict within him, she thought that. I mean, we could say that maybe she was manipulating him. But that's not the way the movie really presents it. Right, She's well, constantly having to resist his intrusions on her. Yes. And then and then you have this weird moment where, and, and I hope we get to talk about this scene too, where she does go into the dark hole, because that I will say that that is a really powerful moment. And I want to talk about that. Okay. But then after that moment, when she's in the hut right. and you hear her talking and you think she's talking to Luke. And then you realize, oh no, she's talking to the projection of Kylo Ren yeah. and sharing this very intimate moment with him because Luke has re sort of rejected her at that moment. And, but that, that's just so incongruous. <laughs> like this guy just killed your potential father figure. Right. And you think that he's going to like that you can have this uh yeah, that, that it, just it, it just that it doesn't this. make any sense like no, i, like what I you felt said. very uncomfortable with that now if she yeah, i like what you said about how it could be strategic and that you know she doesn't really she wants to find out where her family is from she wants to know where she exists in this universe she wants to know who her parents are and i could see that kind of strategic thinking that you were talking about like well, if I bring Ben Solo back to the light side, then I don't have to worry about this resistance war anymore. I can go off and focus on me now. But there's no reason for her to try to solve this Luke and Kylo Ren family drama and be caught up in the middle of it like she's some lightsaber wielding Jerry Springer. Like it, does, it doesn't make any sense. 
Uh, all right. So look, we, we're, 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 we're running short on time. There's a couple more things I want to get to. So let's talk about the throne room scene for a minute, because there's a lot to unpack there. So Snoke says that he manipulated both Rey and Kylo Ren, controlling their thoughts to bring them together. And he said, this is Snoke saying, he said, there's nothing that Kylo thinks or feels that I don't know. That's but I can't means. see the lightsaber <laughs> about to go right through but the But then Kylo kills <laughs> Snow pretty damn easily, like right there. So that's like, to me, red flag number one, right? Yeah. But then, then after they kill Snoke, who is theoretically the most powerful dark side master in the galaxy, he's that powerful. Then to get out of the throne room, Ray and, uh, and Kylo have to team up in a battle to the death with Snoke's guards. So Snoke's guards are more deadly and dangerous than Snoke. I couldn't really wrap my head around that one. I, honestly, I never, I never felt scared by Snoke. He didn't oh. do anything for me. Oh, he was me. a terrible. Oh, he was a yeah. he was a terrible character. I, yeah, just, I mean, we don't understand him. how he got to where he, I mean, he just sort of, a, and, and really this came from the, was that, he, he was in the first movie too, right? He or was. I should say yes. that he was, he yeah. Was. So I, I never really got that, like, where did this guy come from? No, he had no, gra he had no gravitas. Yeah. I mean, yeah. to me, he was just like the golem in Liberace's dinner jacket. <laughs> oh, good, 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 good. So, so I have to say, that's not really Ryan Johnson's fault. Um, but in, in any case, it's still, um, it, you're right, that that whole scene, it, visually, it was really cool to watch. It's what it's cool to watch the red just the red. kind of no, it, burn the, away. The, the, the movie, it's a, it's a very good looking movie. Yeah, it's visually, a, it's, it is very good looking. Yes. Um, all yes. right. So I want to get to two things at the end of the movie that. Um, but I can we can we please talk about the water scene, please, please? Yes, please, let's please. do it. Let's do, let's do it now. Do it now. OK, so I I loved the scene where she goes into the, the, the underside of the island, yep. which is like, okay, so this is the dark side, right? Yep. But okay. Visually, this is, this is womb stuff right here. Yeah, it's this is no, but, but it's also, she goes down into the birth waters, right? right. Okay. This is a rebirth scene right Th this is so like if you look at this religiously right. she's going into what she thinks is death <clears throat> and she's really going into that means it's it's a baptismal scene oh, is really okay. what's happening it's interesting and, i didn't i didn't see it that way but i well I, see that's why you bring on a theologian <laughs> to help right. you figure I these like things it. out right <laughs> and and so she's she so she's in the steps she's underneath the island she's in these birth waters and she's seeing herself Yep. And, and, and not seeing, you know, what she's hoping to see, which is her, you know, who her parents not are, her. Right. but it's still, it's also very firming. Like, this is you, you are you like this, this is who you are. Like to me, that, that, mo that part made the movie for me. I actually really liked that. Part. It was, it was, it was a, it was a cool <laughs> moment the, for me. The problem is that it was just a moment. And it didn't, to me, I didn't feel like they really built on it from there. It was just like, it, it was a, you know, in a, in a vacuum, just as a standalone segment, I think it was really clever and interestingly done. I just wish they had kind of really developed that theme. Um, well, but I think that's the, that's the theme that says, you're not nobody. Look at how, you know, you are expansive. You go all the way this true. direction, okay. all the way that direction. So I, I think in that, that that's, a, that's a turning point for her that she knows she's not nobody. Yeah. All right, that's, I think that's fair. I think that's good. I just think, that, like you said, I wish they had developed that further. Like when Kylo Ren tells her after that happens, like, I am nobody, that she makes some kind of reaffirming statement to him. Like, I'm not no one I meet. Something like that. There had to be some more development on her part to just sort of concrete and just bring all yeah, that stuff like together. She could have just <laughs> said, yeah. I am in this story. This is my story. This, this like she my... could have claimed that, right. but that would have been I, like, I, oh, I, now this, there would have been your I, me I, too moment, right. baby. I, I, I am Ray. This is my story. Yes. That's what we needed to hear. Right. Okay, good. Good. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> all right. So, all right. At the end. So 
It was an, it was a, it was an interesting moment. So Rose says to Finn, and and uh, you know I feel terrible for the actress. She was treated horribly um, uh, for playing Rose. Um, wasn't her fault. I, I don't. It was a poorly conceived character. I thought, but had nothing to do with the actress. She was, I know she was treated badly. Um, um, she says to Finn that, and it was a. I thought it was a. It was a good piece of dialogue. He said, "The way we stop. The way we win is to stop fighting what we hate, and start fighting for what we love." And just that one piece of dialogue by itself, I said, "Yes, that's a good moment." I and, say no. Well, I say no, and here's why. That line is actually paraphrased off something in a Star Wars book from the '80s. True uh, fact. I don't. I don't have the source. I spent like an hour well, today trying to find that, but I, he, I, like I, I know, like you, like it's a it's a good line, but it's like Ryan Johnson didn't come up with it. Well, that's like, okay. I mean, fair fair enough. But just <laughs> as a but as a thought, I think it works. However, the way she saved Finn was by crashing one ship into another ship. It's just a miracle. It's just a movie miracle that they didn't both explode and die. Yeah, that <laughs> makes no sense at all so, whatsoever. So if you're going to tell me that you're going to say you, that you're going to win by by fighting for what you love, don't crash a spaceship into another spaceship that's being piloted by someone that I claim that I love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe just find so just just so we can have like a kiss oh, scene, right? Just so we can to have distract them. us and create this three-way tension then yes. later between okay. yeah, all right. it, just, all right. it makes no sense where they're trying to like kiss in the novelization they take it further that when in the beginning that uh, you know uh finn is talking about ray and uh rose is just like acting like it literally says in the text like uh, she's dismissive she's jealous of ray and it's like we don't need this like i think that's the one thing that ryan johnson got right about this movie is everyone has hard eyes for finn so we've got Ray, we've got Poe, and we've got uh, uh, Rose all fighting over Finn. That's like, that's the only thing that Ryan Johnson does really right in this film. Uh, all right. Well, all right. <laughs> quickly interlude to the folks who came in a little late. If you have any questions or comments for me or the panel, send them in the chat box and we'll get to them in a couple of minutes. All right, final question. All right, now this is a moment that, right, we gotta talk about this one. At the very end know. of the movie, Luke, he finally emerges from the shadows to save the day. But let's just think about this for a minute. First, he says, I've cut myself up, cut myself off from the force. And this is for years, right? Then he decides after years of inactivity and depression and whatever else he's going through that he's back and already he's as powerful as he's ever been. In fact, so powerful after having been cut off from the force for years He's so powerful that he can force project himself across the galaxy. And then the strain is so great that he dies. Uh, I had a really hard time buying this. I don't know. What do you guys think? I think just the whole transferring of matter that Ryan Johnson introduces is uh, ridiculous because that should that could have come up really helpful like way beforehand. But I want to hear what uh, you have to say because I'm introduced. I'm interested in the uh, theologian take that I feel like you have on the scene. Yeah, it's um, at first it's it seems really cool. Like oh my gosh, she's using his powers in a way that goes beyond just the ghost showing up um, as we've seen in, in, uh, in, in which Yoda does in that movie um, and and actually you know and hits him and you know feels him but this is this is not coming from the dead where the dead can like harness their powers and sh and show up in incarnating in this he's actually incarnating himself he's like a ventriloquist from way across the universe and 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 it's it, and there's actually a clue when you see the fight scene that the ground beneath his yes, feet does know, not turn red. red. I did yes. know I did notice that. Yes, and, I saw and, that. And, yes. and and but you're wondering like, so you don't think Kylo Ren wouldn't have noticed that? Oh, or, or, <laughs> no, not really. Honestly, no. Or sensed it. Or With sensed it. Yes. Yeah. 
right, right. But so was was Kylo Ren just so consumed with his anger and hatred, which of obviously he was, you know, fire more, 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 more. You don't think that maybe you would have gotten a clue that he's more powerful than you at this point if he can survive all of that firepower? Or maybe there's some kind of Jedi mind trick going on here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. the ultimate Jedi mind trick. And it's great that Luke gets to go out on this. But you're right, Russ. We don't get any sense that he's been training to do this. Like the idea would be that he's been on the island training to do this, not cutting himself off from the force, yes. but in fact, being schooled by those who have passed on yes. the same way that Obi-Wan was when right. he went yeah. into hiding Again, you tell me that they're like right and they you know they imply it and especially if you want if you read so I've, I've watched all the animated shows and there's more layers to the force i'll buy that if you say look there it's like peeling the onion right there are more layers to what the force might allow one to do i'll accept that but you got to give me a little hint beforehand Absolutely. before the big moment yeah. this is right you got to show the gun in the first part of the movie before you break it out in the final scene like you got to show Although it like I uh I hate to give anything to Ryan Johnson because uh the movie just as its own doesn't seem to blow up but he does he does foreshadow it when he tells Ray I think it's in the scene where they're in the waterfall when the, the he feels the water falling in his hand he says something about you can't be projecting yourself here right now that would kill you or something like that so well, I feel like that does sort of set up for Luke dying down the line but just the fact that he doesn't sense that Luke isn't there and they have this whole big battle and he doesn't sense that he's fighting with essentially a hologram it doesn't make sense well to project i mean even if you argue that the projection is a power across the unit across the galaxy is a pretty big move and if you're going to tell me that you're that powerful you got to show me beforehand a glimpse of that power all right so that's all well, can, and can i just say one one yes. theological thing here yes. So there, there's definitely a messianic thing going on where he walks through walls, right? So he, he right. first, before he goes into the battle, he appears basically in the room with the disciples, right? Who are all scared and they're huddled. Yeah. And all of a sudden there he is. And he has these moments with the disciples. And then he goes out and he, you know, he, and he fights Kylo Ren. So there's, you know, uh, Krasava, that you're right. There's definitely some theological, biblical allusions going on there. But it's just such a mishmash of things that you don't really get any kind of coherence yeah. out of it. All right, look, exactly. that was great. So now it's time for the special segment of the show where we- Oh, the wheel, where we spin the wheel. All right, <laughs> on the wheel are seven possible categories. Wherever it lands is what you get. And the categories are Attack of the Clones, Punch a Chewy, Swap of the Gold Bikini, Inspector Gadget, The Comedy Seller, <laughs> Jedi Powers, and Spin the Droid. All right, Kusava, you're up first. All ready? You ready? Yeah. All right, what do, we, what do we got? You got, oh, Swap of the Gold Bikini. All right. So, <laughs> okay. tired of being sexualized, Leah escapes Jabba's lair and in an act of fair play imprisons someone else and forcing them to wear the gold bikini and chains. Who does she pick? Oh, good. That question. is an excellent. Oh, my question. gosh. <laughs> wow. That's a really good question. You know what? I think just for laughs, I'm going to say Baby Yoda. <laughs> oh, I, I did not see that coming. Baby Yoda, that is totally, wow. I would never have <laughs> wow. gone there. Wow, that's a, that's a creepy fetish if there ever was one. Whoa, I don't even know where to go with that one. <laughs> We're just going to let that one go. <laughs> oh, poor Grogu. Oh, that poor kid. <laughs> okay, I did not see that coming at all. All right, Leah, you're up. Okay, you're up. I'm subverting expectations. You did it. You are. Yep, you definitely <laughs> win the prize with that. <laughs> okay, all right. Comedy seller. Okay, so uh, what do we got here? Um, all right, stand up comedian Bill Burr played the fast talking, opinionated Mayfield in The Mandalorian. What other stand up comic from any era would you like to see get a role in any Star Wars show or movie? Uh, I want to see Jim Gaffigan. Yes. Jim Gaffigan. Oh, he's great. Oh, that's a good I one. would love to see him in like one of the bar scenes where he's like, 
what's going on? <laughs> Why does that guy look like that? <laughs> Do you see that? <laughs> He would be great in a bar scene. I'd yes. love to see his character yes. there. You got it. all right. That was great. All right. So now we're gonna do a little shared screen. We're gonna we're gonna do a little uh, sell your stuff. All right. So bear with me for a second. And what do we got here? Make sure that I'm doing this right. All right. Are you are you seeing are you seeing this? Yes. Okay. So Leah, what do we got? Okay. This is the one of the books I wrote, Preaching in the Purple Zone. Um, it's basically for churches and pastors trying to figure out how do you deal with politics and how do you deal with it without blowing your church up? So preaching in the purple zone. All right, great. Oh, hang on. I think I, I lost this for a second. That's a very nice image right there. Hold on. Hold on. I got to do this again. Sorry. My bad. All right, here we go. And then, uh, here we go. Okay. All right, so quick, uh, Krasava, tell folks where they can check out your Star Wars website. Wait, you still put mine back up. Oh, I know. I, I don't have an image for her. Oh. That's fine. Yeah, um, so you can check out my Star Wars articles on Scavengers Holocron. Um, you can also check me out on my website, nitchristmyers.com. I gave you the link that hopefully you put that in the, in the uh, description below. If not, you could just add that to your YouTube page. I don't have a novel yet. I was gonna get it published in 2020 but then the pandemic hit and everything went totally crazy oh i've been God. working on this thing for like four years on my own sci-fi epic so all right awesome get all right, her so, done all right, get so it out there. Yes. all right ch check out Krasava's site and uh, and all right as for me uh since we since you're a fan of space opera with action humor and suspense i'll encourage you to check out my novel crossline about a modern day space pilot thrust into a parallel earth caught between rebellion, Armageddon, and a desperate fight to get home. And if sci-fi mystery is more your game, I'll point to my sci-fi mystery, Crackle and Fire, featuring my hard-boiled intergalactic private eye, Angela Hardwick, part Doctor Who, part Blade Runner, and part Philip Marlowe. Crossline and uh, Crackle and Fire are both available on Amazon and published by Crazy A Press. And if you want a signed copy, uh, you can order them from me directly. All right. so. I want to thank my panel here. This was a great show. Hold on, let me X out of here. All right. Um, I want to thank uh, Leah and I want to thank Rosava for, uh, for coming back onto the show. And I want to thank everyone who's watching. I'm your host, Russ Colchamiro, and I'll see you all next week. Take care now, guys. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. It was good. All right. Take care. <laughs>